everyone, and welcome to our podcast, That's So Auburn. I'm Auburn's Mayor Nancy Backus, and thank you for tuning in today. I'd like to welcome any first-time listeners and also give a shout-out to those that are returning to listen for more. Today's episode continues our multi-part series covering homelessness and how Auburn is responding to this issue. In our first two episodes, I was joined by Kent Hay, the City of Auburn's Anti-Homelessness Outreach Administrator. That's his new title, about the things that he is seeing and working on in the encampments around town. He really has one of the best firsthand perspectives related to Auburn's homeless persons. In today's episode, we will be hearing from others in our community that are also working on bringing people inside. And let me remind you, everyone, that is our mission, to bring people inside. We do not support any activity that enables people to continue to live on the streets longer than they have to, and we urge everyone in this community to adopt that mindset. There is nothing humane allowing people to live outside. With that in mind, I would like to introduce you to the person that has likely been working longer than anyone in our community to bring people inside. I have with me today a very special person, and I hope many of you know her or know of her, and that is the Executive Director of the Auburn Food Bank, Debbie Christian. Debbie Christian, in my opinion, is an angel on earth, and I try and make sure that she knows that every opportunity I get. Debbie, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having me, Mayor. It's really good to have you with us today. But before we begin, I have to know, is this your first podcast? Well, I was asked that when I walked in the room, and I said yes, and then I went, wait a minute. I think I was on one about five years ago with a real estate company. Okay, well, welcome to your second podcast, okay. then. I'm honored that you are here with us today, and as I said earlier, I believe you've been on the front lines of homelessness in Auburn longer than just about anyone. I think it would be good for our listeners to hear more about how you have seen this issue evolve in Auburn. So uh, prior to being on the food, with the food bank, uh, I worked at a local church and we did see homelessness come through, Um, but a lot of it seemed to be the traveler, somebody that was coming through Auburn needed some money to get somewhere. Once in a while we'd hear of families that might need help with their rent or their power, Um, but pretty much the homeless weren't necessarily seen. And then just seems like something expanded, you know, 12 or so years ago where suddenly instead of being hidden away in a forested area, they're now sitting right here in our street and they're on the park bench and everywhere where it's just really, really noticeable. So that was kind of the first thing I've noticed, I had noticed. And I guess in the beginning too, it was almost always men. And now I see just every age group and every person uh and and recently we've seen more youth we've seen more seniors um and and more families i mean it's just been one of those things that has just exponentially grown mm-hmm. and it's there's no one reason for no. for people the stories are so different with everyone and debbie i would venture to say too that when there have always been individuals experiencing homelessness. I mean, through through time, there have always been people who have been unsheltered. But I think you were talking about prior to 12 years ago, a lot of a lot of individuals in town knew there were there weren't many. You knew who they were. You might have gone to school with them, and they're just down on their luck, or for whatever reason an addiction, something like that, caused them to be homeless. And I don't know that there was a great deal of fear in our community. Mm -hmm. But let's talk a little bit about what it looks like now. As you said, it's it's more visible. Individuals who, for whatever reason, are unsheltered are far more visible. They're, They're at the bus stops. They're at the grocery stores. They're on the sidewalks. They're asking for money at the off-ramps. Uh, and, and I'm not just saying that only individuals experiencing homelessness are, are going to do those things or, or be in those places. That's, 
that's not what I'm trying to say, but we do have a sense that there are more people in our community. And if you are in our community, you are a community member. But there are more people in our community that are unsheltered. Do you, do you think it's worse now that the now with the pandemic than it was before the pandemic started? Well, we haven't really been hearing that. There was that theory, there mm -hmm. was that fear, uh, but that we're not hearing that. Okay. I'm not yet hearing that people have been put out of their homes because they've lost the ability to pay their rent. Or mm -hmm. I, I think that's coming. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that's coming. But so far, I haven't felt like that's been the main, you know, reason. Mm -hmm. I still think a lot of the reason is our is the mental health first. There aren't any place to take them. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, so many mental health places shut down 10 to 12 years ago. Yes. And so that put a lot of people out because a lot of them might not have had family to start with. And then here you are now, no place to go. Um, so I, th I think that's a lot of it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to blame the pandemic yet. Okay. And there were a lot of, there were the, the eviction moratorium to mm -hmm. help keep people in their homes there has been rental assistance, mm -hmm. utility assistance. In Auburn, we've been, we use some of the, the CARES Act funding and some of the ARPA funding to provide rental assistance as well as utility assistance. So there, there have been those financial opportunities for people. And, and the preventive portion is so critical because keeping someone in their home is so much easier to do than to rehouse someone once they have become homeless. Mm -hmm. And we work side by side with you, and I am so thankful for the work that you do on behalf of the entire community and uh, other service providers in the area and to meet the needs that our cities are experiencing. And it's no secret that putting things in place has been challenging, right? Even... You know, in, in Auburn, I think we have a pretty good network. The service providers know each other. They, they know what each service provider can and can't do. And there's no fear of picking up the phone and, and saying, hey, Debbie, there's an individual sitting here with me. I think you can help them. And vice versa. You, you call on, on, uh, other nonprofits and other individuals, the faith-based community. It is one wonderful network here in Auburn. But what do you see as some of the biggest challenges? Challenges to help a homeless. Some of it is the perceptions out there of other people. Um, some of it is the fact that there just isn't enough money. Uh, there isn't enough housing. There isn't enough there just isn't enough. <laughs> and, and I'm not really, I don't throw money at stuff, so it's not that I look for that. Mm -hmm. um, you can get somebody into housing occasionally, that you know, fairly quickly sometimes, and yet for them, it's now scary again. So they have, they've grown up in a home, and if it were functional, they might still, and if they've been out a couple of years, mm -hmm. they can get back acclimated into life. If they've been out for a very long time, everything starts over again. And then who's there to help them? Who's there to say, this is how you turn on the water. This is how you wash your clothes. This is how much soap you use. Don't forget to read the label. <laughs> you know. Uh, so all of that seems to revert back to... I don't know what I'm doing anymore, and I mm -hmm. and I don't know how to start over. Mm -hmm. And then, then they're in housing alone, and they're scared alone again. You know, it's scary to be out on the street. That's yes. a horrible. It's a horrible start if you have to go out on the street, and you're scared of that. But um, pretty quickly, you uh, find that group of people who are gonna take you in because they are very good at taking each other in. They all understand that. They're all understanding that we're afraid to be out here, and if we hang in numbers, we're going to be safer together. Um, and, you know, maybe I have something you need and you have something I need, you know. So, so a network gets created pretty quickly. And then you're asked or shown or given a home, and you're then pulled out of that network. 
because really the apartment complex doesn't really want you bringing in 14 other your people network, to live in yeah. your home. <laughs> so now you have to start over again. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think the network inside is a lot meaner than the network outside. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, to break into that circle again, you know, to find where I fit. And and then everybody wants to know where do you work and what do you do? And I don't, mm -hmm. you know, so the, those stigmas come back to you again. So I think those are really hard things to mm -hmm. do. Um, trying to keep the person in their home sometimes is hard uh, especially to see if how far down they've gotten, you know, they've run out of money, they've run out of resources, they don't have family anymore, or families turning them away enough. And, and sometimes it's just not necessarily uh, them, you know, right. uh, just stuff happens. And yeah, we all make bad choices. Yes. And, and we all need to pick ourselves up and we all need to learn from our bad choices. And sometimes the hardest thing to say to somebody is, you know, I, I can cheer you on and get you this far, and then you need to do that, and you need mm -hmm. to do that on your own. And pull up your bootstraps and tie them on tight, because the next, the next step is yours. I can't get you beyond that. Right, That's right. you. And, and make that step, and then we're still there on the other side. We promise, you know, that, that I, I, it's the, con I don't know if it's convincing, if it's... Um, it's a trust. That's a big thing too, you know. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. There are also gaps in services. Mm -hmm. When when we were talking with Kent about getting people into housing, first of all, with some of the housing vouchers, you cannot work, right? Right. So that question of Makes where no do you sense. work is even more traumatic because maybe they want to work, mm -hmm. but if they do, they lose their housing voucher, which Government can be so convoluted sometimes, and, and we're part of government, or I am, and so I, I'm, you know, I, I just sometimes struggle with how we put programs together. I'm sure there was a good reason for it to begin with, but it just doesn't make sense on a regular basis. And so those gaps where someone doesn't know even how to budget, right? They have very little money after paying for their for their housing. So how do they budget for food and essential items? Those things are not intuitive to most people, and especially if you have been outside and you've had that trauma of being outside, and then you, you've been chronically homeless, and now, hey, we are so happy. We're putting you into housing. Good luck. Let us know how you're doing. And, and that is almost as inhumane as leaving someone outside. Mm -hmm. At least they're sheltered, but, but we're setting them up for failure if we don't continue with that care and find where the gaps in the services are. And you're right. At some point, they have to be on their own or not as much help. Mm -hmm. I, I think we all look for help from one another, from community and from organizations, but they will, they have to, they have to build confidence in themselves again as well mm -hmm. and build that trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with, uh, in our previous episodes with Kent, we talked a lot about community and, you know, the mantra of compassion, accountability, and community. We, we have compassion we're going to hold everyone in this process accountable because you are part of our community. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that people can help our community better, members best, uh, understanding their role in helping people come off the streets. So what words of wisdom would you have to our listeners that want to help? I think all of us have a talent that we can share. Um, and sometimes people are afraid to do that because they're afraid it's going to take up you know, a minutia of their time. You know, I grew up in a fairly decent home, but I got into college. I didn't know how to budget for myself. I didn't, I didn't mm -hmm. save a dime. I didn't know anything. So, but I could call home and ask. Mm -hmm. Could there be people who would say, just call and ask me? Maybe, maybe it's a hotline. Maybe it's a, 
anonymous, you know, Mm -hmm. where someone can say, I just got moved into this house and I don't know how to use this washing machine. Could you walk me through that? You know, I can take pictures, I can send you pictures and you show me what to do. So I think if people were trying to do that and just give a little, (laughs) there so much happens when somebody gives a little bit and then every little bit becomes a big bit. I I think, I think people are so afraid of, this is going to take, like you say, Mm -hmm. so much of my time, or I don't really have any, anything that I can offer any special talents, but I think we all have some talents that we could share. Mm -hmm. And I I love that idea, a hotline or something that, that would help individuals. You know, there are great people with financial expertise that could help even with that small amount of budgeting or how do I read the bus schedule? Mm -hmm. How do I, we have some familiarity with the systems and we struggle at times trying to get through to the right people. Imagine that you are out on the streets and you might have a phone, you might not, you're borrowing someone else's phone and you're put on hold or told, we'll call you back in a couple of hours. Those are really stressful times. And for someone who is just on the edge, that might be the thing that just pushes them over and they say, forget it. We're, I'm, I'm just going to stay out here. I don't like it out here, but I am, I am better off out here than, this, than the stresses that I'm going through. Um, so I know how I feel about this, and I know how Kent feels about it. How do you feel about individuals who are at the off-ramps asking for money, and you see the car windows roll down and that individual hands over a 5, a 10, a 20. What would be your recommendation to people who want to do that? So I get this question a lot from friends, and I usually tell them, please don't do that. Mm -hmm. However, if in your heart of hearts and in your gut, you believe at that moment that that is the right thing for you to do, then please do it. But on any given moment, it probably isn't. And knowing how many people stand out there and how many people come in and then show me what's in their pockets, Mm -hmm. they have made a very good day's wage. Mm -hmm. Um, You are taking the jobs away from those of us who have been put in place to help them. Uh, You're telling them, basically, you're telling them don't bother to go to those places because me and this line of cars are going to take care of you. Mm. Uh, You're you're more than not assaging your own guilt by seeing them standing on the street corner. Um, And I don't mean that lightly you know it's I I never want to take away your heart to give Mm -hmm. but I don't really think that there's a lot of help in handing out money you want to hand out a granola bar fine um if somebody's standing there and say they need gas you don't see a car anywhere hmm I'd question that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) or could you go get in your car and follow me Mm mm-hmm or I'll go get five gallons in my little tank here and I'll bring it back to you. I'll meet you at your car. Um, I'd much rather see that kind of thing happen because you'll then feel, you'll figure out really quickly what's right Mm -hmm. and what isn't. I I, I think, Debbie, you really hit on it. It's it's seeing someone struggle. We're coming off the off-ramp and we see someone standing there who may have a sign that says, Uh, veteran, homeless, hungry, anything helps. And it is really hard because in our minds we want to believe the best in people. Mm -hmm. And there are those homeless, hungry veterans out there who would love a $5 bill Mm -hmm. or a $20 bill. Typically that's not who's really out there. Mm -hmm. And, And I... I, I would challenge people that if, you, if you're having that moment that you just feel like, I, I can't avert my eyes, I, I have to help this person, really consider whether that money is helping them 
or if it would be better served by providing that same dollar amount to your favorite nonprofit, mm -hmm. the service providers who know individuals, who help individuals, and have that expertise. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, we're not going to run out of food. Right. Not going to happen. So if they're hungry, put them in the back of your car and bring them. That's what, if you feel like that's what's necessarily, and I, and I don't say that lightly either because that's the way I grew up. My dad picked up all the hitchhikers and mm -hmm. we took them somewhere. <laughs> never left one standing there. So <laughs> uh, he never handed them money. Uh, I never saw that, but we always gave them a ride to where they wanted to go. You come by this work honestly, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So before we close on this on this section, I, I think it's only fair that we remind the audience that you are leading a food bank and homelessness became an official part of your work recently and that much of the work that the Auburn Food Bank has always done is to provide that safety net to people so they can remain in their homes and the services you provide to others is truly amazing. I've said it so many times, you are an angel on earth and I don't know how you find ways to get everything done in a day that you do, but I can tell you that this community is so much better off because of you, because of Debbie Christian, and the heart that you have and the love that you have for this community. Uh, can can you let, let our listeners know all of the things that you and your small but mighty staff and volunteers do for the community every day? This is this will be mind-blowing for some people who are listening it because I don't see how you get it all accomplished. So the Auburn Food Bank operates four days a week uh, at about 100 families a day that come through. We have uh, six paid staff, and we work with about 70 volunteers throughout the year. So we can have two volunteers a day or 15 volunteers a day. So food is our main goal, and... Um, Along with that would come our community supper meal on Monday nights, uh, where we're serving between 80 and 100 every Monday. Uh, we also support the other two uh, meals that are happening with food support. Um, we have a home delivery program. We, um, uh, we work with uh, financial aid for housing and rent and medical assistance. Um, we can do some small amount of gas vouchers if people really need to get to doctors or work, um, some challenges like that. And then uh, about 10 years ago, I started doing um, cold weather sheltering during the coldest times of our year. Kind of like and, right now. <laughs> right now. And uh, opening up just for the cold weather. And you'd be open five days, maybe 15, sometimes 25, just depending on what the weather looked like. And I had a team of volunteers that managed that. And then three and a half or so years ago, we opened up the Ray of Hope with the city's support, and Valley Cities at the time was a big support with us, and um, opened up day sheltering uh, full-time year-round and night sheltering as well. So we have uh, capacity for about 40 to 50 in the day room, and we have uh, beds for 39 in our night. Uh, we're holding three of those for hospital visits all the time. And then, of course, now uh, the cold weather is back with us, and so we need a place to be able to do that is to open up for those that don't, maybe they, maybe we don't have room for them in the night shelter, mm -hmm. but but mostly there are people who don't really want to come in and, and spend the night. Uh, they might have a place to go that they think is warm, um, but they're traveling from here to there, and so they need a place to stop and get warmed up. And so coffee's on, food's on, dinner's ready. And uh, we've opened up this week now, and we will see anywhere from two to two to thirty-two mm -hmm. in in a night. Um, always different. We also have some safe parking that's happening at the shelter every single night, uh, so we can take in sixteen cars for safe parking. And we've been running between six and twelve, mm -hmm. kind of just depending. You know, people people always want to choose something that's better, and if they can choose the driveway of a fr family friend or a family. They'll do that before coming in and even staying in the in the shelter, you know, staying in the in the safe parking. Makes sense to me. I want to be where my family is, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we do a little bit with, I used to do a lot more, but a little bit with domestic violence um, because we know that once a situation has happened, it takes about three days before they can actually get acclimated over to the, the resources that should be helping them better because uh, we aren't. We are focusing on domestic violence, but I can keep them safe. Mm -hmm. So 
I get a phone call. Um, I can do a motel for three nights to get that family safe somewhere, and then the uh, the other agencies pick them up and get them into their transitional housing programs. So, unfortunately, my board <laughs> made at some point a uh, part of our mission statement that said and emergency services. So, if I think it's an emergency, we <laughs> jump on it <laughs> and. And I dragged them along. <laughs> They've been very supportive of everything. So, uh, but but we don't want to leave that emergency out there that nobody's touching. So if there's a if there's an agency that can do that, we're going to recommend that they go to that agency that's that specializes in their in their emergency. And if not, then we're going to help them along until we can find something else. You and your team, uh, staff and volunteers, are that friendly, trusting encounter that so many people need. The accountability is always going to be there. I've, I've seen you with that tough love approach and, and I admire it, but I have also seen how you have given chances to someone who many people would have said, nope, that's it, you're gone. And you, you expect a lot out of people that are, that you're around, but you give so much that, uh, this community, as I said, is so much wealthier and so much more blessed because you are here, Debbie. And I just want to thank you for all that you do, for your volunteers, for your staff, and for the people who are trusting enough to come in and find that warmth, that shelter, a place to get resources, to work with Kent to work with you, to work with others in our community to help them find their way out of homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now I'm pleased to have you here from one of the service providers that's been working side by side with Kent out in the encampments. Kent, who's joining us here today? Yeah, Mary. Today we have uh, Kalina and Josie from the We Care Clinic, and uh, we do outreach every Friday, and then I also participate on Wednesdays at the We Care Clinic, offering um, other services that uh, that that help out there. Excellent. Well, welcome, Kalina and Josie. I I've heard that you've been a great asset to Kent's work over the last year or so. So, before we get started, let me first just say thank you. We need more people like you out here uh, helping individuals in need. So thank you. Yes, well, thanks for having us. Yes. Maybe, Kent, to, to start, tell us a little bit about some of the service providers that you take into the encampments. Yeah, so on, on Tuesdays, I take out Health Point, take a nurse out with me, um, who's a suboxone nurse, and we do some wound care stuff, and then also some... Uh, harm reduction things out there in the encampments. And then again, like I was saying, on Fridays, uh, uh, folks from the We Care Clinic come out and we do outreach um, to offer different services that they offer at the, at the We Care Clinic to help people with their substance abuse disorder. So maybe that's a good place to start. Maybe Kalina and Josie, you can tell us a little bit about what, what services are provided and who can utilize the We Care Clinic a okay. little bit about that. So We Care Clinics um, has been in Auburn for almost three years now, and we serve the population who has opioid use disorder, and we help them with medication for that opioid use disorder. So um, Suboxone, uh, Methadone, Vivitrol, and uh, anybody who has an opioid use disorder uh, can come in. We're also licensed as an outpatient uh, facility, so we can do counseling only for people who have any kind of addiction. That's I, I hate to say that that's a much needed service in our community, but it certainly is, and mm-hmm. can't thank you enough for the work that you do. People who are in need of those services, sometimes they don't even realize they're in need, I know, and so you have provided hope and health through through the work that you do and just want to say thank you both personally and as the mayor of the city thank you so much for helping out it's part of our community anyone that's in our community we consider a community member and so just knowing that the needs of our community are, are being met or addressed 
is is something that's really important to me. Do either of you go out in the in the encampments with Kent? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. I met Kent last year. Has it been over a year now? Seems like it's been that. that Seems long. like it's been a I long know. time. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> no. Um, and uh, I, before I worked at We Care, I was in Pierce County, and I did what was called involuntary um, treatment. Uh, for people and so when I came to We Care I was really shocked that there wasn't any kind of an outreach and then I met Kent and I was like great we need to get together I'd like to go out with you and bring a couple of my other counselors with me so that we can meet the community and you know let them know what we provide and um, not only do we provide services for substance use disorder and the treatment with the medication and of course counseling but we have a wonderful peer staff that helps them with every other aspect of their life, trying to get into shelters, into housing, um, employment, um, clothing, getting their ID, just about everything that somebody could need to try to get back on the road to recovery. It sounds like it could be overwhelming if not provided with people who truly care and, and want to help with with the needs of those who have a substance use disorder. So, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how do you approach individuals in the encampments and then what's your method for getting people to accept the help? Well, normally um, Kent is really great about like pre-advertising that we're coming with him. (laughs) So he knows the area so well. Um, He knows what people might want our services. And so we go and he introduces us to them and we just talk to them about if they want help, right, and how they can get their help. Um, uh, I haven't been out since I got a little promotion, and so Congratulations. I'm kind of sad about that because I really like going out and camping. So Josie is one of the um, staff that goes out along with Tanya and Tiffany and Chris, and uh, we basically just talk to them. We talk to them, we let them know that there's people that care about them, that just because they have a substance use disorder doesn't mean that they can't get help, and we would love to help them in any way that we can. It's mostly about building rapport and trust with them, too. The more that they see us, the more that they can trust us, and then the more willing they are to seek services at that time, too. And do you, obviously on that first introduction, it's probably (laughs) going to be difficult People are not going to just readily jump up and say, yes, I'm ready for the help. Right. I, w- I want to go now. Is there any type of typical timeline for someone to to say, yes, I want the help? I mean, it's not like it's your third time out and all of a sudden you're going to get everybody saying, yes, I, I want help. But are there any similarities? Are there trends that you see with the individuals that you're working with? You know, not really. Everything is so individualized. It just depends on whether or not they're really ready for help. Um, There have been a couple of times, actually, where they they wanted to go that day. They wanted to come and uh, do their assessment and see the doctor and get started right away. That's wonderful. Um, And then there's those that, like Josie mentioned, that we just go see every single week. We let them know that we're still serious about helping them just because it wasn't just a one shot hey it's today only Um, and because Kent has a good uh, reputation with Mm -hmm. all of the people that um, are unhoused that's a great segue because they already trust us because they trust Kent Mm -hmm. that's great Kent I can't I can't see enough the great work that you do and and the wonderful service providers, partners that walk alongside, because that's that's not easy to walk into an encampment. Josie, how long have you been doing that, and what were your thoughts before you went out and then after you went out? So I've been only doing this like about a month now. I think I've only went out like maybe two, three times with Kent so far. It's a little bit um, scary at first, but Kent being there really makes it so it's more comfortable because, like you said, he knows the people that as we go in there. Um, but, you know, it's just all about just making that initial impression with them and letting them know that there's somebody there, that they're not alone, and that, you know, that there's help out there is the only thing I could say that's the best thing we can do for them. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, there are going to be some that just want to say there should be something involuntary about this. 
We should just get them off the streets. We should get them out of the encampments and just force them into treatment. I don't think that's the right answer. And that's certainly not what we have in the state of Washington. Right. So the involuntary approach is probably not the best approach to get people to actually want or be accepting of and be successful in services. What, and, and again, I know that every person is individual. When you've talked to five people who have substance use disorder, you probably never hear the same story twice. Mm -hmm. Everyone is an individual. We all have our own unique situations. So are there, are there approaches that you see that are more productive than others that have more successful outcomes? Well, one of the things that you really want to be aware of when you're, when you're conducting outreach is that everybody who's out there has had a lot of trauma in their lives. And you want to be very sensitive uh, to that fact. Um, so we do trauma-informed care. Um, we have people come to We Care to train people about de-escalation and trauma-informed care and um, how to approach people. And I think it's, like I said, I, I think it's just really getting to know them and really putting out there uh, the genuine, we're here as people, you're a person, and we really want to help you out of the situation if that's what you would like. Can you talk a little bit more about trauma-informed care? I think a lot of people have heard that term, but maybe don't know really what it is. Can you kind of break that down for us a little bit? Well, it's really, again, just realizing that if you have gotten to the point where you are unhoused, there's a lot of trauma that has happened before that, um, probably from childhood. Um, a lot of people who have substance use disorder didn't wake up one day in their 20s and say, I'm just going to go use some heroin. You know, um, it's been in their family history, whether it started with alcohol or some other drug. And then all of the abuse and neglect and things that happen in, in one's life that's led them to where they are. Mm -hmm. So just kind of knowing the history of that and knowing how to approach them, um, gently talking to them, um, I mean, there's physical things like learning a distance and learning how to not come up in somebody's bubble, if sure. you will, and, and things like that. But just basically treating them the, as a person and as not a intimidating number. them, mm -hmm. right? Which I do very well because I'm 4'11". <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very seldom that I meet people that are shorter than I am. Uh, and I'm 5'4", so you'll see me in heels most of the time. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I think that is important, though, mm -hmm. that we we have a better understanding of, of how to work with, how to support someone who has substance use disorders and is hopefully at a point where they're wanting to work through that. I, I know there's frustration. I hear, I get emails and phone calls every day from people in our community who are just upset. Mm -hmm. just, just round them all up, lock them up put them into treatment. Again, we're not in a state where that is really an option. I don't think it would be a great option, even if it were. But accountability, you know, Kent, Kent and I talk about it a lot, the compassion, accountability, and community. Mm -hmm. So we know we have the compassion. We know we're part of a community, but along with that comes that accountability to be part of the community. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you help individuals who are utilizing the services at the We Care Clinic, which I, I just think the We Care Clinic is a, is a great place when I had the tour there. It's just phenomenal, the things that, that you have set up. But how do you start to introduce accountability back to someone who may have lost that? Well, that does take a minute, right? Um, we have a lot of, we're very privileged to have a lot of different services that a lot of other opioid treatment programs do not. One of them is transportation. And so we can um, make sure that the patients get to our clinic every single day if they're on our transportation route. Um, it takes about six weeks, six to eight weeks for somebody to become stable on their medication and to stop actually using illicit substances. And then once that happens, um, we offer groups for them to come to. 
Um, we offer individual counseling. That's actually not just offered, that's a must if you want to be part of the program. And um, through all of their counseling, that's when the accountability starts in, right? We offer, part of the program is for them to have a monthly UA to make sure that they're accountable for what's in their system. And um, as they continue through the program, they get to have more privileges as far as not having to come to the clinic every day. Um, and it's set up so that the, mo the more that they're doing in their recovery for themselves, uh, the more their, their carries that they get to have. And it's, it just, but it has to start with meeting them where they're at. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't just throw accountability at them right away. Right, <laughs> right. Accountability is going to look different to everyone. Mm -hmm. Right? And and how we hold ourselves accountable is certainly going to look different than individuals who are f first coming into your clinic right? or that definitely. you're meeting mm -hmm. with Kent. Kent, what is it meant to you to have the We Care Clinic team come out with you? I, I only partner with, and I tell people all this all the time, but I only partner with agencies who really do the work because I'm really about doing the work. And so... The, the fact that the We Care Clinic is willing to come out to encampments, I mean, we go, there's no place in Auburn that we don't cover. Um, I've taken uh, Kalina on some some mountainous trips. It's really good exercise. Really good exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the great part about that, again, is we, we've been to places where we've been talking to people and people are ready that day. And um, once we're done and I drop people off, or drop them back at the clinic, they'll go out and pick those people up sometimes and bring them back. Wow. There's times where I'll pick somebody up and take them directly to the We Care Clinic because I, I know who to, to contact and I can walk them in. And that's the great thing about the We Care Clinic because it's open. You can walk in if you're ready. Mm -hmm. There's no appointment. You don't have to call and next week and somebody will see you in whatever days. You just walk into the office and start, yeah. start beginning the process. And so that's the great part of taking, again, the We Care Clinic out is... Um, the ability to start your, you know, to, to start moving forward um, that day uh, mm -hmm. and, and someone to talk to you and navigate you through what you need to do. And recently we went out into the park and we went to an encampment where there was some arguments going on and all that stuff. And it happened to be um, a lady who was willing to um, take us up on that. She had court mm -hmm. that day and she was supposed to do all this stuff. And it was, she just was having a really hard day that day, and so Josie was out there with us, and um, there was a plan that they put together, and she pretty much followed the plan. I mean, she yeah, went to the WeCare clinic. And she showed up that day and went to the WeCare, and she actually did her court hearing over WeCare on Zoom, <laughs> and the judge actually saw that it was WeCare and encouraged her to continue with us and to continue to meet with us and follow up with it. So, um, and she was happy that she was there with We Care with us. So, right. and then we followed great. up with her the, the following Friday. We went back to the mm -hmm. encampment and started putting together some more plans. And yeah, so, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those are the stories we need to hear more of. Mm -hmm. right? We need to hear of of people who are are coming out of whatever demons they're they're dealing with mm -hmm. uh, to to know that there are caring people, professionals who are willing to meet them where they are, out in the encampments or when they come in and not ready to necessarily take that step, but they're interested at least. They're intrigued by what you do. So I want to thank you both, Kalina, Josie, for the work that you do, for your willingness to be out with Kent, because it's not always, well, it's not always a fun place to be. But these are people, these are community members, and you are providing them with an opportunity and for hope and for a life that is better than what they're currently experiencing. So Absolutely. Yeah, we're thank actually, you. We're actually expanding our outreach. Exciting. Um, because we have uh, two mobile units that are going to be launched Pretty soon, we we have them on the parking lot now. They they got all wrapped with our We Care sticker and all of that. Um, our first unit will be up in the U District, uh -huh. and uh, our second one will be somewhere in Pierce County, probably in the Tacoma area. Um, but what we're what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking as much as we can that we do in the clinic, 
and providing that on the mobile unit. Mm -hmm. So we'll be doing a lot more remotely. Um, we're hopefully serving more people that are really in need in the outlying areas. You're removing the obstacles right. in the removing way of a person. Removing all the barriers mm -hmm. that we right. can. Yeah. Right. And there's, I mean, I could just brag about us all day. Like people come in, we hand them a lunch if they haven't eaten. You know, they sit with a counselor and they do their assessment. Um, we take them to the clothing bank if they need clothes. We hook them up with Debbie Christian. She's one of our partners from Ray of Hope. Um, we work at the uh, community court resource. center, mm -hmm. resource center, every Thursday. So um, we really try to just have all of our, our little touches out there so that we can help as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm sure Thank people you. who are listening have learned a great deal. And uh, I encourage you, if this is not just for individuals who are out in encampments, this is for mm -hmm. anyone That's right. who has substance use disorder, who is ready to take that step mm -hmm. uh, to a better life. Yep. So yep. thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having us. Great. All right, welcome back everyone. And Kent is here with me again and he has a guest with him that I know you will enjoy hearing from. Kent, thank you for being back with me again today. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Today we have Michael Prince here and Michael is someone I met, he says 10 months ago, it feels like almost a year. So yeah, and he's, he's done an awesome job and I'm, I'm glad how things have turned out and so I'm glad he was able to come here and talk with us today. Well, Michael, thank you. It's wonderful to meet you, and thank you for agreeing to be here to share your experience with us. And And the photo that you just showed me of the day that you first met Kent and were, uh, I guess, uh, introduced to the Ray of Hope. It, that's Is that correct. right? Uh, your photo looks incredibly different than you look today. That it's, was a long time ago. <laughs> it's amazing what 10 months can do for an individual. Do you want to just share a little bit of whatever you feel comfortable sharing with us about your story? We would love to hear it. Well, um, like I said, I, I, I came to Auburn in, in April. Um, unfortunately, I came out of jail. Um, in it was kind of weird because I got down here with nothing. I was sent down here from DOC, and I had I basically didn't have idea. I had nothing, mm. and ended up at uh, Valley City, and which sent me over to the Ray of Hope. And then the next day, I met Kent, and then we were off to the races. And <laughs> it, uh, you know, I've been in a month or in the ten months, I've been able to get my ID, my insurance back. Um, I have housing now, which I have it, I've had now for a month. Um, right. uh, got my social security card, and it's just been phenomenal the, the amount of help that I've gotten down here. Well, we we appreciate individuals like you who are who are willing to to do the work. Right? We you've heard us talk about accountability, or that Kent and I talk about it a lot, and I'm sure Kent mentions it outside of being here with me, but. Um, Compassion, accountability, and community are the things that we hold very close and, and believe in. Um, what what type of work have you had to do, Michael, in order to get the housing? What what does that process look like? You and you and Kent working on social security, your ID, housing. That doesn't all just you don't just snap your fingers and it occurs. So no, it doesn't. Tell, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that process. I think a lot of people are are unaware of what it takes. It, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to, you know, to, you have to put in the work, like you say. I, it was something, I think that's a lot of the problem is that um, people don't understand where to go and how to, to get to those points. And uh, Kent, we have Kent, of course, and with, you know, in his community center. I was there before the community center got started. so. I mean, we were working more one on one then, and you know, he, he just points you in the direction, and it's you know, it's, it's, he, he, and the mental health aspect is a big thing also. Mm -hmm. um, so it it has to all come together. You have to have, you know, people like Kent, people like you, you know, and and the the whole group, you know, Debbie, um, 
everybody. It just, it, 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 it gets to the point to where it's overwhelming trying to get sure. things done, and especially with COVID going on, it made it very, very hard. So, and, and it, you get a lot of support, you know. Um, Kent pushes you, yeah, you know. Yes. So He pushes me too. I just want <laughs> you to does. know. He's awesome. He pushes everyone. He's an equal opportunity <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> encourager. <laughs> So, Michael, that had to be incredibly challenging. You are brought down here from DOC, and my guess is you didn't know Auburn very well, or had you ever been in Auburn before? I had never been in Auburn before. Never been in Auburn before, uh, and yet you are brought here, dropped off with a good luck. That has to be um, in so challenging and and just un, unsure of what what's next right so how does how does that feel you you were dropped off you know nobody what were you going to do i had no idea it was it, like you say you're just abandoned mm -hmm. you know I, I was you know sent down here i was given bus tickets to get down here to check in i did and that was it and um, fortunately for me, I was able. I, the DOC office is right across the street from mm -hmm. Valley City, so I was able to go to Valley City. Valley City has been a huge help, <clears throat> excuse me, for me. And it, you know, I got the help I needed. I didn't, and I was stuck because I did. I didn't. I'd had a couple heart attacks and some strokes. I did wasn't on my medications. Yes. And Kent, in the beginning, that's the first thing Kent did was get my medications back. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it just it, it was just one day at a time, it, and it was, and it it was a struggle. You know, it took us what four, almost five months to get Social Security to give me my my card, yeah. and you it know, shouldn't be that challenging to get yeah. Social Security card. Yeah. And you know, and he got me signed up with DSHS, and you know, um, the people from the Ray were very supportive in getting my um, insurance benefits back, and. And just moving forward, you know, and, and the housing thing um, was a struggle also, and but we kept at it, and we finally got there. So, and in the meantime, you had the ray of hope and the sundown. I'm yes, assuming. And Chris at the sundown. Yeah. Uh, well, we believe that we every every community, every city should have the responsibility and the care of individuals in their community. Right. It's it's not a matter of uh, you are an individual experiencing homelessness in Seattle, but oh, by the way, head down to Auburn because they've got the Ray, they've got Kent. That's not how this should work. No. It, it should be that wherever you are and wherever your support system is, that's where you should be able to seek services. But I'm glad you're here, Michael. It, it, I, I love success stories. I love to hear, uh, you know, just I, we have masks on just for anybody that's <laughs> wondering. This is prior to us being able to be unmasked in inside. But just your eyes. You know, I, I saw the photograph of you 10 months ago. And just to see your eyes, the clarity in your eyes. And, and I can tell you're smiling. Mm -hmm. uh, the smize, I guess they call it. But. It's, it's so heartwarming because a lot of times I will get emails or phone calls and, and it's from individuals saying, get them off the streets. We, we're tired of it. We, I don't want to see it, basically. I don't want to see people out on the streets. Well, for the most part, people don't want to be out on the streets no, either. Right? So um, to, to hear a story of, of your endurance and working in partnership with Kent. Kent, Kent has all of the, all of the contacts and, and can do the work, but you had to put in your time as well. Yes, and he made sure I did. <laughs> <laughs> he does that to me too, like I said. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, because what I want people to get from this when they hear Michael's story is like, you, you hear 10 months and it's like, oh, he, he got it, but the amount of work and frustration that it that it took. I mean, just the, the medication alone. I remember the day it was like we went to um, one farm. We went to schedule an appointment. We went to to 
one place out here to get his meds, it wouldn't help us. Another place wouldn't help us. We drove all the way up to another place on the hill that wouldn't help us. It was like a, I don't know how many hours wait that we would have to wait there. We're calling Seattle. I mean, it took a long, it took a lot of work yeah. just to get his medication. He hadn't had his medication and they released him from jail with no medication. Mm -hmm. And so he was, the medication he was supposed to be taking, he could have lost his life from not taking that medication to get out of heart attack. And so, you know, just that day was stressful. You know, and so every day after that, I mean, you know, to do the work is trying to get a hand voucher, the phone calls, um, you know, the, the him making his phone calls and, you know, the evaluations and the, and then trying to get the cash assistance and we had to apply multiple times and it's a it's a lot of work. So, you know, I know we can just say ten months, but I'm telling you it was a it was a long time. I mean this the system is not set up to be easy. Um, and I I know people don't understand that, but it's not set up to help everybody. It's it's if I wasn't helping Michael and we weren't able to jump through all these hoops, a lot of people aren't able to to do these phone calls and make these appointments and travel to all these places and do all this stuff. And so it's, it's, it's challenging, you know? And so I give a lot of credit to him because I always tell people, I'll give you, you know, 99% of my time. I just need 1%, but you know, he, he put in, he put in the time and I'm glad he's housed now. That makes me very happy. It yes. took us a while to, to get there too. It did. And you're right. It's it's that partnership again of give a little, give some of your time, give give your abilities. But it, it's just so sad to think that you were that you were let out without your medications. I I just that's that's hard for me to even hear to think about. And then the fact, like Kent, you said, if if it wasn't for you who knows how to work through the system, someone who's out here on their own would never be able to maneuver through. It might take 10 months to get one thing accomplished because, as you said, it's not necessarily set up to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a reason for that, although at this point in time, I can't even conceive of what that would be, but... I'm sure there are some reasons, but we need to make it easier for people to access the resources that we want them to re that we want them to access. That's why I'm I'm proud in Auburn because we do have a pretty good network set up. The nonprofits know one another and they work together. It's not it's not secret keeping in Auburn. We we work together as part of the community. Michael, any, any other thoughts or anything that you would like to share with us? Yeah, it is exactly what you say. It's, it's, it, you get overwhelmed out there and you get lost. And without, um, you know, Kent and the, the community resource that he's set up, uh, people are, there's nowhere to go. So that's a big deal. Well, we are, we are very proud to have you here with us today. I'm proud to know you. The fact that you are willing to do that work, to to have a home, a place to call your own, I commend you for that, and, and thank you for being a part of our community, Michael. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you very I'm glad much. Glad you got to stay in Auburn. So. Me too, and I think I'll stay here for a while. Too. Good. Go. It's a good place, isn't it? Is. It? <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael Kent, for being here for this portion of our of our show. That's so Auburn. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for joining us for our third episode of the podcast, That's So Auburn. I hope with today's episode, you have heard and learned from not just Kent Hay, our amazing anti-homelessness outreach administrator, but also from two of our service providers at the We Care Clinic, Josie and Kalina, and then this heart-wrenching story of Michael, who had been sent to Auburn without knowing anyone, without any money, without any idea what he was going to do, and then how sometimes fate intervenes and he went to the DOC, which is across the street from Valley Cities. Valley Cities 
uh, referred him to the Ray of Hope Resource Center and Debbie Christian. And then the next day he met Kent Hay, the amazing Kent Hay. And within 10, I'm sure it felt like very long months, but within a year, Michael is now in housing. And I can tell you, sitting across from him, he looks, he looks happy. He looks as if he has purpose back in his life. And I am so proud to have met him and to heard his story. And I hope you feel the same way. Not everyone who is experiencing homelessness has the same story. Every story is different. And we do have to treat people as individuals. We can be frustrated at times, but we always have to remember that these are people that we are dealing with. These are people, someone's mother, father, son, daughter, uncle, aunt, cousin, and they deserve compassion. They deserve to be held accountable and they deserve to be part of our community. So until next time, that's so Auburn. Thank you.